for coming. Thanks for coming to uh, my talk this afternoon. I am going to be covering the antiviral therapies for mild to moderate COVID-19. So we're talking about outpatient management of COVID patients. I gave this talk this morning to the Martha Stewart uh, outpatient docs, and uh, we had uh, some good questions uh, at the end that I'll address um, with you today. So my objectives this afternoon is to discuss three antivirals that are available um, for the treatment of mild to moderate COVID-19. And I'll start with a case to kind of illustrate the type of patient that may be uh, a candidate for these agents. And we'll talk about how to distinguish which agent you might uh, want to use. I'll review the uh, NIH guidelines and, and, that, and the local guidelines that correspond to it uh, as well. So I'm gonna start with a case. Uh, this is Julie. She's a 94 year old woman who comes to the clinic and she has two days of severe cough, shortness of breath. She has a fever and she tested positive uh, on a home, home test. Her O2 sat was at 96% and she had several risk factors for severe, uh, to progress to severe COVID-19, namely diabetes, CKD, hypertension, um, and she is not vaccinated. Uh, I've listed some medications here for you. This is going to be important, especially when we talk about Paxlovid, which contains ritonavir, which causes many, many drug interactions. So we're going to set the stage with this patient. So the current outpatient therapies for mild to moderate COVID-19 uh, really has evolved over the last year. Um, initially, when the Delta variant was predominant, we had the monoclonal antibodies that were um, used uh, for Delta. Since then, since Omicron has now come uh, to the forefront, uh, the only monoclonal antibody that, is, uh, that works against Omicron is sotrovimab. I'm not gonna talk about that uh, medication today. I'm gonna stick with the antivirals, but just so you know, um, so trovimab is the only monoclonal antibody that has been shown to be effective for Omicron. Today, I'm gonna talk about uh, nermotrelavir and riotonavir, that is Paxlovid, monopiravir, and remdesivir. Remdesivir was just uh, approved for a mild to moderate COVID-19, uh, the end of January. So this is, that was a, a late addition to this presentation, but uh, we now have three agents. With regards to the NIH uh, guidelines, uh, and this is as of January 19th, um, in order of preference, they have listed Paxlovid first with the dosing here. It's a five-day regimen um, and for all of the, for the three I'll talk about today, they're indicated when a patient presents with symptoms within five days. Um, second is uh, the monoclonal antibody, so trufimab, that is an IV infusion. Uh, remdesivir, again, which was just approved on January 22nd. So um, we'll see, the guidelines have not been updated yet, but uh, the dosing is correct here, um, and the recommendation is that you give it within seven days of symptom onset, although the state now is just saying everything within five days. Uh, that's a lower level recommendation. And then monopiravir is last, and that's 800 milligrams twice daily for five days. And uh, we'll talk about why it's last um, when I review the data with you. So what is mild to moderate COVID-19? It's defined as someone who has, who's saturating well. So an O2 sat greater than 94%. Uh, they have a positive chest, chest X-ray. And then the typical symptoms of COVID-19, fever, cough, uh, maybe they can't, they're losing their taste or sense of smell, uh, but they don't really have um, shortness of breath so much. 
So all the, the current guidelines are recommending these antiviral agents for those patients that you identify have a high risk to progress to severe COVID-19. And they really emphasize this point because uh, supply is limited. You know, it's very hard to, to get these medications. So you'll want to think about what risk factors does my patient have? In this case, she has diabetes. So the green checks are the risk factor she has. So we also need to check off um, diabetes, obesity, she has CKD and she is of an older adult. So pretty much that describes a lot of our, our patients. This is the obligatory mechanism of action slide. And I'm just gonna point out two areas, two targets that uh, you should be familiar with. The first is the fusion step. And that's where, the, where vaccines and monoclonal antibodies work to attack the spike protein. So that's what you're familiar with and that, that occurs here as the first step. The, the area where uh, these newer antivirals work is, is that they inhibit RNA replication. And this is like the fourth step in the whole entire process. Um, monopiravir in particular causes viral mutagenesis. So it causes genetic mutations um, and that is how it inhibits RNA replication. This will be important as to why we're not going to be using this in children. So as with all of my talks, uh, I'd like to present you with the data where the recommendations come from. I'm going to highlight the three uh, main studies that uh, were highlighted in the EUA for these medications. Um, and led to our current recommendations. The first trial is unpublished. Right now it's on the, the clinicaltrials.gov website and you can find information um, through the EUA. Um, but this was a phase three randomized placebo controlled trial in about 2000 patients. These are outpatients. They are not vaccinated. And they included patients, again, who presented within, 15, within five days of symptoms and had at least one risk factor for se severe progression. So that's any of the ones I listed, uh, immunosuppressed, CKD, and so forth. And there was also a requirement that if they uh, were of childbearing age, they should use contraception. Um, patients that were excluded were HIV patients, uh, those who were vaccinated with the COVID-19 vaccine, those who had low O2 sats, those with renal impairment, liver disease, pregnancy, and breastfeeding. For all three drugs, the, the study design is almost identical. So in this particular uh, study, it was a five-day study, and it was Paxlovid, uh, versus placebo. And the typical patient here is mostly white patients. It was pretty much split between men and women. 5% uh, black, 14% Asian, you can, you can see here, but almost 50% of Hispanic and Latinx patients. Two thirds had symptoms within three days of the start of study. And these were younger patients. These are patients of the mean age of 46. So with as far as primary outcomes, all three drugs that I'll talk about today, all of them reduced COVID-19 hospitalizations and all-cause death. Here you can see that Paxlovid, uh, Paxlovid, the number needed to treat um, was 18. So you need to treat 18 patients with Paxlovid for 28 days, I believe, um, to prevent one hospitalization and all-cause death. Um, in terms of all-cause mortality, uh, there were no patients in the Paxlovid group who had died. In terms of tolerability, you can see they're, they're fairly similar, um, just the Paxlovid group had more um, taste issues. Now, the main thing you want to think about if you're considering Paxlovid for your patient, and that is you need to do a thorough review of their medications because uh, the ritonavir, 
portion of this uh, medication is it's a cytochrome P453A4 inhibitor. So this is just a short list. There are many, many uh, drug, other drugs that it interferes with, but I wanted to put some, some of the classic drugs that a lot of our patients are on. So if you were to give Paxlovid with any of these medications, amiodarone, quetiapine, um, nif uh, nifedipine, these are the dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, statins, um, all of those levels can increase when given with this drug. So it'll be important for you to um, use a drug interaction checker and just plug in everything. And I'm gonna show you some of those resources in, in a few slides. The next drug I'll talk about is molnupiravir. This is the move out study. Uh, this was in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, was, was printed actually today, um, but was, uh, online released in December. But similar design, as I mentioned before, they all presented within five days with their symptoms. These are adults. Um, they excluded patients with um, low GFR, those who are on hemodialysis. And what's different here is they also excluded patients with ne severe neutropenia and low platelets. So this is a five-day regimen. Uh, the typical patient the median age here was 42, so similar, younger patient. Uh, most of these patients were obese in terms of their risk factors with a BMI greater than 30. Uh, and then it was split male, female. Now the data here uh, shows that there was about a 30% decrease um, in hospitalizations or death versus in the EPIC HR, this previous study I mentioned with Paxlovid, it was 80, it was like 87%. Um, so uh, this was a, a lower efficacy rate, um, but still monopiravir uh, still came out ahead versus placebo. And the third study is the pine tree study. And this is uh, the newest uh, approval for outpatient mild um, to moderate COVID-19, and that's remdesivir. So many of you are familiar with remdesivir in the hospital. We use it inpatient, um, but now it can be used uh, outpatient. And, and the data here, same design. This is less people. This is over 500 people. Um, and uh, similar exclusion. The main thing here with remdesivir is that uh, you know, it can cause hepatotoxicity, so you do have to check LFTs prior to starting, to starting it, and um, it's not to be used with creatinine clearance less than 30. So, uh, as unlike the other two medications, remdesivir is IV, and it's a three-day regimen instead of a five-day regimen. And you can see here uh, that this, these were mostly white patients. Um, and 30% were over, were over 60 years of age, but had uh, the you know, risk, risk factors for severe COVID-19. So the primary outcome here, again, we're looking at COVID-19 related hospitalization or death from any cause. So what you can see here is remdesivir is this red line on the bottom. The number needed to treat here was 21. I did the math for you. And uh, so this is, is quite good. And so this is a 28 day, at 28 days, you treat 21 people with remdesivir for those three days. And you'll see a relative risk reduction of about, again, 87%, 80, you know, you'll see it reported as like 90%, um, but this was statistically significant. There were secondary outcomes. I'm gonna show you one of them here. Uh, this was looking at COVID-19 related medically attended visits or death from any cause. And again, remdesivir uh, beat out placebo. This was about a, an 80% uh, improvement compared to, to placebo. 
Now to make it a little less confusing, I put together these tables, hopefully to give you a sense of um, what's important to think about when prescribing these drugs. So at the top here, I've, I've uh, illustrated uh, the dosing. With Paxlovid, Paxlovid is basic, the 300 milligrams of neutrelivir is it's two 150 milligram tablets of that drug with 100 milligram tablet of ritonavir. So you're gonna take those three tablets twice a day for five days. So that's three times two, that's six, six tablets, six tablets a day for five days. Uh, when you look at uh, monopiravir, these are 200 milligram capsules. So there's four of them that you take twice a day for five days. And then remdesivir, as I said, is an IV uh, formulation. And that is 200 the first day, then 100 and 100. Again, the primary outcomes were all, they all decreased hospitalizations and all caused death. And here I've put the efficacy for you just so you can compare them. So for Paxlovid and, um, Paxlovid and Vecluria, which is remdesivir, it's an 87% decreased risk of the primary outcome versus uh, for monopiravir, it's, it's less, it's 30%, okay? Now with Paxlovid, again, the, one of the main things you need to think about are drug interactions when you're looking at this drug. Um, there is a dose reduction for patients with an EGFR between 30 and 60. You can give it to patients who are greater than 12 years old and uh, more than 40 kilograms. With monopiravir, because it's mutagenic and cause, it works by causing mutations, that's why it's not, uh, it's definitely contraindicated in pregnancy at this time. Uh, as well as um, you need to be 18 years of age or older to take this drug. Uh, and it does cause, it has been shown to cause bone and cartilage toxicity um, in children. Um, so this, these are kind of important um, highlights of this particular drug. With remdesivir, as I said before, um, monitoring LFTs is gonna be very important as well as renal function and you can give it greater than 12 years old. In terms of adverse effects, um, with Paxlovid, again, you saw that six patients in that study had some taste, um, taste issues, um, and then all of them have reported, well, monopiravir and Paxlovid have reported um, diarrhea. Again, with Paxlovid, don't use it at the EGFR less than 30, and if uh, and in a child pubic class of class C, because it causes hepatotoxicity. Uh, with remdesivir, again, hepatic uh, LFTs, and it can prolong uh, prothrombin time as well. Post marketing, they've seen uh, cases of bradycardia. So if you have a patient who's bradycardic and you can't figure out what it is, maybe potentially uh, remdesivir could be causing it. So getting back to this case, um, is she a candidate for COVID-19 uh, antiviral therapy? And if she is, uh, what, what should we consider? So if we look at the NIH guidelines, they say, okay, Paxlovid generally should be first with a high uh, evidence rating. So the first thing I did was I took her medications and I put it through Lexi Interact. Um, if you should be familiar with LexiComp, we have that in the hospital, uh, any hospital computer, at hospital or med school, and you can get it on your phone. Um, and part of LexiComp has something called Lexi Interact and you would click on the interactions button and you would plug in all, all the medications. And what it will spit out is, will look like this. I did this on my phone and they have letter categories to tell you uh, the level of severity of uh, the interaction. And then you click on it 
and then it'll explain what the interaction is, what should you do, um, and what the evidence is. So you can see here that if you give amiodarone and Paxlovid together, it's an X rating. So when you click on it, it'll show you that this combination can increase the levels of amiodarone. Okay, and it, the recommendation is to avoid this combination. So whenever you see an X, it'll tell you uh, that this is um, contraindicated or you, you, should, you should avoid it. With a Pixaban, um, because Paxlovid is also an inhibitor of p-glycoprotein, so both cytochrome P450, 3A4, um, and p-glycoprotein, uh, there is an interaction with a Pixaban, and uh, this combination can elevate levels of the Pixaban as well. So, so it's good practice. Um, it, it should be part of your uh, to-do list when considering Paxlovid is to uh, use an interaction checker and plug in everything. Um, and if you need help with that, you can definitely you know, send me a text or email me and let me know and I can help you um, with that. Another website that is very good and it's free is the University of Liverpool Drug Interaction Checker. Um, this, has, uh, this is our go-to place if you need questions on Hep C drugs, HIV drugs, um, pretty much, it's very comprehensive. So again, because Paxlovid has ritonavir in it and ritonavir is a protease inhibitor, that's the reason why there's so many uh, drug interactions. And then there's also, of course, the HIV guidelines. And the HIV guidelines have comprehensive drug interaction tables with every kind of combination with uh, antiretrovirals. Um, and so this, that's a very good source uh, as well. Now, so in this particular case, then it appears because of that amiodarone interaction, and if that patient, that patient is presumably on amiodarone because all the rate controllers didn't work for their AFib anymore. So they'll need to be on that amiodarone. In that case, maybe we need to look at the other options. So what about remdesivir? Um, I didn't show you her LFTs, but if her LFTs are fine and her renal function's okay, uh, and she's okay with getting an IV, you know, a three-day IV uh, injection, and you can find it, uh, then remdesivir may be an option. Because this was so, this was just approved for outpatient, I do not have information right now as to how to access this yet. Um, the Mount Sinai guidelines, the latest are from January 18th, and this approval came out January 22nd. So I, I think they are working on it. Uh, so that's to be determined. Now, what about monopiravir? Uh, this is, again, oral. This is a five-day regimen. Um, it does have this boint, bone and joint toxicity uh, precaution. So, and while it was in children, I mean, you could have that discussion. If I have a patient who has osteoporosis and has joint issues, do we wanna avoid it? I mean, this would just be clinical judgment at this point. So um, you can think about that. Now to access, you probably heard this from all the uh, system emails from Mount Sinai that if you want to put your patient on Paxlovid or Monopiravir, there's a one pharmacy in Manhattan that, can, that has it. There is a hotline from the New York City Department of Health that it's a finder, like a location finder. So if you live on Long Island, you may be able to find it out there. Um, but for Manhattan, it's just Alto Pharmacy. And they're sort of like a uh, capsule. If you go to their website there, they have, they have other franchises all over the country. But you should call this number first before sending over your prescription. Make sure they have it. And then um, they will deliver to your patient at a New York City address the same day if you order it by five o'clock during the week and one, one o'clock during the weekend. So that's pretty amazing, but definitely call first uh, before you send over the prescription. 
And then another important point about any of these drugs, just like I was I talked about with the pre-exposure prophylaxis, this, these agents are not a substitute for the vaccine. Um, all the studies were in vac unvaccinated patients, uh, but we should still be encouraging, of course, our patients to get vaccinated. So in summary, again, these three agents are for mild to moderate COVID-19 patients. So those are your patients that you see that have an O2 sat that's okay, greater than 94%. Uh, they're not on oxygen, they don't need oxygen, and they have risk factors that you're worried that they could progress to severe COVID-19. So CKD, diabetes, obesity, dementia is also on that list. Um, and you do need to start it, the recommendation is within five days of symptoms. So really educating our patients uh, who are maybe healthy now and they're, they're seeing you in clinic and just educating them and say, hey, if you, if you notice any of those mild to moderate symptoms, give us a call, come in and, and potentially they would be a candidate for these agents. Um, I already spoke about autopharmacy and when asked, well, what, what's the patient oriented reason why you know, we should give these drugs, why we should, these are an option. And, and that would be because they all have been shown to decrease the risk of COVID-19 death and hospitalization. Um, the question, two questions that came up this morning, one was regarding Omicron. Do these agents cover Omicron? The studies that I uh, presented here were before, did not address Omicron. Um, this, this, this is before times. Um, but there is, there is a preprint, there is some in vitro data that suggests that all three of these agents are, are, uh, do work against Omicron. In fact, uh, Mount Sinai, the, the preprint that is being circulated around to support this is from a study done here at Mount Sinai. Again, it's in vitro data, but uh, you will probably see more studies coming out looking at specifically the Omicron variant. The second question that was asked this morning was, what about vaccinated patients? You know, all these studies were in unvaccinated patients. Um, if you, at this point, we don't know, like based on these studies, we have no idea how to extrapolate the data to fully vaccinated patients, booster, including the booster, um, even patients who have breakthrough infection, who are fully vaccinated, we don't know. Um, how these drugs will perform. But the recommendation from the state, I believe, is to um, give it, just give it to your high risk patients. So you might have a patient who is, regardless of their vaccination status. So you may have a patient who's fully vaccinated, they're boosted, but maybe you think that they're not going to uh, achieve an immune response, 100% immune response, like, like everybody else, um, then as long as you, you feel that your patient is high risk, then they can be a candidate. Um, so, but these studies don't, don't show that, um, but that is, um, that's the current recommendation. So you can give it regardless of vaccination status, but just know that these studies are based in unvaccinated patients. And with that, I'm happy to take any additional questions you might have. Um, and that's it for me. Are there any questions? This data is changing quickly. Um, when I was asked to do this talk, I was only going to be doing oral agents 
and then remdesivir was approved like just two weeks ago. So um, we're, we're trying to catch up. Oh, I see in the chat, hang on a second. Okay, is remdesivir also within five days? It, the study was seven days, did I show you? I think the study was seven days, but the Mount Sinai guidelines, the state just says five. They like give it within five days, but the study did use um, seven days for one of them. Good question. You're welcome. Well, if there's um, any more questions. All right, well, I'll be circulating, uh, I'll circulate these slides so you can have them for your reference. Um, again, they'll probably change next week, um, maybe tomorrow, <laughs> but, um, but thanks so much. Appreciate you guys uh, coming this afternoon.